Pink Pearl. The Affair of the Pink Pearl was first published in the sketch, the 1st of October 1924. Dr. John Thorndike was created by Richard Austin Freeman 1862-1943. What on earth are you doing? demanded Tuppence, as she entered the inner sanctum of the International Detective Agency slogan, Blunt's brilliant detectives, and discovered her lord and master prone on the floor in a sea of books. Tommy struggled to his feet. I was trying to arrange these books on the top shelf of that cupboard, he complained. And the damned chair gave way. What are they, anyway? asked Tuppence, picking up a volume. The Hound of the Baskervilles. I wouldn't mind reading that again some time. You see the idea, said Tommy, dusting himself with care. Half hours with the great masters, that sort of thing. You see, Tuppence, I can't help feeling that we are more or less amateurs at this business. Of course amateurs in one sense we cannot help being, but it would do no harm to acquire the technique, so to speak. These books are detective stories by the leading masters of the art. I intend to try different styles, and compare results. Ham, said Tuppence. I often wonder how these detectives would have got on in real life. She picked up another volume. You'll find a difficulty in being a Thorndike. You've no medical experience, and less legal, and I never heard that science was your strong point. Perhaps not, said Tommy. But at any rate I've bought a very good camera, and I shall photograph footprints and enlarge the negatives and all that sort of thing. Now, mon ami, use your little grey cells, what does this convey to you? He pointed to the bottom shelf of the cupboard. On it lay a somewhat futuristic dressing gown, a Turkish slipper, and a violin. Obvious, my dear Watson, said Tuppence. Exactly, said Tommy. The Sherlock Holmes touch. He took up the violin and drew the bow idly across the strings, causing Tuppence to give a wail of agony. At that moment the buzzer rang on the desk, a sign that a client had arrived in the outer office and was being held in parley by Albert, the office boy. Tommy hastily replaced the violin in the cupboard and kicked the books behind the desk. Not that there's any great hurry, he remarked. Albert will be handing them out the stuff about my being engaged with Scotland Yard on the phone. Get into your office and start typing, tuppence. It makes the office sound busy and active. No, on second thoughts you shall be taking notes in shorthand from my dictation. Let's have a look before we get Albert to send the victim in. They approached the peephole which had been artistically contrived so as to command a view of the outer office. The client was a girl of about Tuppence's age, tall and dark with a rather haggard face and scornful eyes. Clothes cheap and striking, remarked Tuppence. Have her in, Tommy. In another minute the girl was shaking hands with the celebrated Mr. Blunt, whilst Tuppence sat by with eyes demurely downcast, and pad and pencil in hand. My confidential secretary, Miss Robinson, said Mr. Blunt with a wave of his hand. You may speak freely before her. Then he lay back for a minute, half closed his eyes and remarked in a tired tone, You must find travelling in a bus very crowded at this time of day. I came in a taxi, said the girl. Oh, said Tommy aggrieved. His eyes rested reproachfully on a blue bus ticket protruding from her glove. The girl's eyes followed his glance, and she smiled and drew it out. You mean this? I picked it up on the pavement. A little neighbor of ours collects them. Tuppence coughed, and Tommy threw a baleful glare at her. We must get to business, he said briskly. You are in need of our services, miss. Kingston Bruce is my name, said the girl. We live at Wimbledon. Last night a lady who is staying with us lost a valuable pink pearl. Mr. St. Vincent was also dining with us, and during dinner he happened to mention your firm. My mother sent me off to you this morning to ask you if you would look into the matter for us. The girl spoke sullenly, almost disagreeably. It was clear as daylight that she and her mother had not agreed over the matter. She was here under protest. I see, said Tommy, a little puzzled. You have not called in the police. No said Miss Kingston Bruce, 
We haven't. It would be idiotic to call in the police and then find the silly thing had rolled under the fireplace, or something like that. Oh, said Tommy, then the jewel may only be lost after all. Miss Kingston Bruce shrugged her shoulders. People make such a fuss about things, she murmured. Tommy cleared his throat. Of course, he said doubtfully. I am extremely busy just now. I quite understand, said the girl, rising to her feet. There was a quick gleam of satisfaction in her eyes which Tuppence, for one, did not miss. Nevertheless, continued Tommy, I think I can manage to run down to Wimbledon. Will you give me the address, please? The Laurels, Edgeworth Road. Make a note of it, please, Miss Robinson. Miss Kingston Bruce hesitated, then said rather ungraciously. We'll expect you then. Good morning. Funny girl, said Tommy when she had left. I couldn't quite make her out. I wonder if she stole the thing herself, remarked Tuppence meditatively. Come on, Tommy, let's put away these books and take the car and go down there. By the way, who are you going to be, Sherlock Holmes still? I think I need practice for that, said Tommy. I came rather a cropper over that bus ticket, didn't I? You did, said Tuppence. If I were you I shouldn't try too much on that girl, she's as sharp as a needle. She's unhappy too, poor devil. I suppose you know all about her already, said Tommy with sarcasm, simply from looking at the shape of her nose. I'll tell you my idea of what we shall find at the laurels, said Tuppence, quite unmoved. A household of snobs, very keen to move in the best society. The father, if there is a father, is sure to have a military title. The girl falls in with their way of life and despises herself for doing so. Tommy took a last look at the books now neatly arranged upon the shelf. I think, he said thoughtfully, that I shall be Thorndike today. I shouldn't have thought there was anything medical legal about this case, remarked Tuppence. Perhaps not, said Tommy. But I'm simply dying to use that new camera of mine. It's supposed to have the most marvelous lens that ever was or could be. I know those kind of lenses, said Tuppence. By the time you've adjusted the shutter and stopped down and calculated the exposure and kept your eye on the spirit level, your brain gives out, and you yearn for the simple brownie. Only an unambitious soul is content with the simple brownie. Well, I bet I shall get better results with it than you will. Tommy ignored the challenge. I ought to have a smoker's companion, he said regretfully. I wonder where one buys them. There's always the patent corkscrew Aunt Araminta gave you last Christmas, said Tuppence helpfully. That's true, said Tommy. The curious-looking engine of destruction I thought it at the time, and rather a humorous present to get from a strictly teetotal aunt. I, said Tuppence, shall be Polton. Tommy looked at her scornfully. Polton indeed, you couldn't begin to do one of the things that he does. Yes, I can, said Tuppence. I can rub my hands together when I'm pleased. That's quite enough to get on with. I hope you're going to take plaster casts of footprints. Tommy was reduced to silence. Having collected the corkscrew they went round to the garage, got out the car and started for Wimbledon. The Laurels was a big house. It ran somewhat to gables and turrets, had an air of being very newly painted and was surrounded with neat flower beds filled with scarlet geraniums. The tall man with a close-cropped white moustache, and an exaggeratedly martial bearing opened the door before Tommy had time to ring. I've been looking out for you, he explained fussily. Mr. Blunt, is it not? I am Colonel Kingston Bruce. Will you come into my study? He let them into a small room at the back of the house. Young St. Vincent was telling me wonderful things about your firm. I've noticed your advertisements myself. This guaranteed 24 hours service of yours, a marvelous notion. That's exactly what I need. Inwardly anathematizing Tuppence for her irresponsibility in inventing this brilliant detail, Tommy replied, Just so, Colonel. The whole thing is most distressing, sir, most distressing. 
Perhaps you would kindly give me the facts, said Tommy, with a hint of impatience. Certainly I will, at once. We have at the present moment staying with us a very old and dear friend of ours, Lady Laura Barton. Daughter of the late Earl of Carroway. The present Earl, her brother, made a striking speech in the House of Lords the other day. As I say, she is an old and dear friend of ours. Some American friends of mine who have just come over, the Hamilton Betts, were most anxious to meet her. Nothing easier, I said. She is staying with me now. Come down for the weekend. You know what Americans are about titles, Mr. Blunt. And others beside Americans sometimes, Colonel Kingston Bruce. Alas, only too true, my dear sir. Nothing I hate more than a snob. Well, as I was saying, the bets came down for the weekend. Last night, we were playing bridge at the time, the clasp of a pendant Mrs. Hamilton Betts was wearing broke, so she took it off and laid it down on a small table, meaning to take it upstairs with her when she went. This, however, she forgot to do. I must explain, Mr. Blunt, that the pendant consisted of two small diamond wings, and a big pink pearl depending from them. The pendant was found this morning lying where Mrs. Betts had left it, but the pearl, a pearl of enormous value, had been wrenched off. Who found the pendant? The parlor maid, Gladys Hill. Any reason to suspect her? She has been with us some years, and we have always found her perfectly honest. But, of course, one never knows. Exactly. Will you describe your staff, and also tell me who was present at dinner last night? There is the cook, she has been with us only two months, but then she would have no occasion to go near the drawing room, the same applies to the kitchen maid. Then there is the housemaid, Alice Cummings. She also has been with us for some years. And Lady Laura's maid, of course. She is French. Colonel Kingston Bruce looked very impressive as he said this. Tommy, unaffected by the revelation of the maid's nationality, said, exactly. And the party at dinner? Mr. and Mrs. Betts, ourselves, my wife and daughter, and Lady Laura. Young St. Vincent was dining with us, and Mr. Rennie looked in after dinner for a while. Who is Mr. Rennie? A most pestilential fellow, an arrant socialist. Good-looking, of course, and with a certain specious power of argument. But a man, I don't mind telling you, whom I wouldn't trust a yard. The dangerous sort of fellow. In fact, said Tommy dryly, it is Mr. Rennie whom you suspect. I do, Mr. Blunt. I'm sure, holding the views he does, that he can have no principles whatsoever. What could have been easier for him than to have quietly wrenched off the pearl at a moment when we were all absorbed in our game? There were several absorbing moments, a redoubled no trump hand, I remember, and also a painful argument when my wife had the misfortune to revoke. Quite so, said Tommy. I should just like to know one thing, what is Mrs. Betts's attitude in all this? She wanted me to call in the police, said Colonel Kingston Bruce reluctantly. That is, when we had searched everywhere in case the pearl had only dropped off. But you dissuaded her. I was very averse to the idea of publicity and my wife and daughter backed me up. Then my wife remembered young St. Vincent speaking about your firm at dinner last night and the 24 hours special service. Yes, said Tommy, with a heavy heart. You see, in any case, no harm will be done. If we call in the police tomorrow, it can be supposed that we thought the jewel merely lost and were hunting for it. By the way, nobody has been allowed to leave the house this morning. Except your daughter, of course, said Tuppence, speaking for the first time. Except my daughter, agreed the colonel. She volunteered at once to go and put the case before you. Tommy Rose. We will do our best to give you satisfaction, Colonel, he said. I should like to see the drawing room, and the table on which the pendant was laid down. I should also like to ask Mrs. Betts a few questions. After that, I will interview the servants, or rather my assistant, Miss Robinson, will do so. 
he felt his nerve quailing before the terrors of questioning the servants. Colonel Kingston Bruce threw open the door and led them across the hall. As he did so, a remark came to them clearly through the open door of the room they were approaching and the voice that uttered it was that of the girl who had come to see them that morning. You know perfectly well mother, she was saying, that she did bring home a teaspoon in her muff. In another minute they were being introduced to Mrs. Kingston Bruce, a plaintive lady with a languid manner. Miss Kingston Bruce acknowledged their presence with a short inclination of the head. Her face was more sullen than ever. Mrs. Kingston Bruce was voluble. But I know who I think took it, she ended. That dreadful socialist young man. He loves the Russians and the Germans and hates the English, what else can you expect? He never touched it, said Miss Kingston Bruce fiercely. I was watching him, all the time. I couldn't have failed to see if he had. She looked at him defiantly with her chin up. Tommy created a diversion by asking for an interview with Mrs. Betts. When Mrs. Kingston Bruce had departed accompanied by her husband and daughter to find Mrs. Betts, he whistled thoughtfully. I wonder, he said gently, who it was who had a teaspoon in her muff. Just what I was thinking, replied Tuppence. Mrs. Betts, followed by her husband, burst into the room. She was a big woman with a determined voice. Mr. Hamilton Betts looked aspeptic and subdued. I understand, Mr. Blunt, that you are a private inquiry agent, and one who hustles things through at a great rate. Hustle, said Tommy, is my middle name, Mrs. Betts. Let me ask you a few questions. Thereafter things proceeded rapidly. Tommy was shown the damaged pendant, the table on which it had lain, and Mr. Betts emerged from his taciturnity to mention the value, in dollars, of the stolen pearl. And withal, Tommy felt an irritating certainty that he was not getting on. I think that will do, he said, at length. Miss Robinson, will you kindly fetch the special photographic apparatus from the hall? Miss Robinson complied. A little invention of my own, said Tommy. In appearance, you see, it is just like an ordinary camera. He had some slight satisfaction in seeing that the bets were impressed. He photographed the pendant, the table on which it had lain, and took several general views of the apartment. Then, Miss Robinson, was delegated to interview the servants, and in view of the eager expectancy on the faces of Colonel Kingston Bruce and Mrs. Betts, Tommy felt called upon to say a few authoritative words. The position amounts to this, he said. Either the pearl is still in the house, or it is not still in the house. Quite so, said the colonel with more respect than was, perhaps, quite justified by the nature of the remark. If it is not in the house, it may be anywhere, but if it is in the house, it must necessarily be concealed somewhere. And a search must be made, broke in Colonel Kingston Bruce. Quite so, I give you carte blanche, Mr. Blunt. Search the house from attic to cellar. Oh, Charles murmured Mrs. Kingston Bruce tearfully, do you think that is wise? The servants won't like it. I'm sure they'll leave. We will search their quarters last, said Tommy soothingly. The thief is sure to have hidden the gem in the most unlikely place. I seem to have read something of the kind, agreed the colonel. Quite so, said Tommy. You probably remember the case of Rex v. Bailey, which created a precedent. Oh, er, uh, yes, said the colonel, looking puzzled. Now, the most unlikely place is in the apartment of Mrs. Betts, continued Tommy. My, wouldn't that be too cute, said Mrs. Betts admiringly. Without more ado she took him up to her room, where Tommy once more made use of the special photographic apparatus. Presently Tuppence joined him there. You have no objection, I hope. Mrs. Betts, to my assistance looking through your wardrobe. Why, not at all. Do you need me here any longer? Tommy assured her that there was no need to detain her, and Mrs. Betts departed. We might as well go on bluffing it out, said Tommy. But personally I don't believe we've a dog's chance of finding the thing.
Curse you and your 24 hours stunt, Tuppence. Listen, said Tuppence. The servants are all right, I'm sure, but I managed to get something out of the French maid. It seems that when Lady Laura was staying here a year ago, she went out to tea with some friends of the Kingston Bruces, and when she got home a teaspoon fell out of her muff. Everyone thought it must have fallen in by accident. But, talking about similar robberies, I got hold of a lot more. Lady Laura is always staying about with people. She hasn't got a bean, I gather, and she's out for comfortable quarters with people to whom a title still means something. It may be a coincidence, or it may be something more, but five distinct thefts have taken place whilst she has been staying in various houses, sometimes trivial things, sometimes valuable jewels. Phew, said Tommy, and gave vent to a prolonged whistle. Where's the old bird's room, do you know? Just across the passage. Then I think, I rather think, that we'll just slip across and investigate. The room opposite stood with its door ajar. It was a spacious apartment, with white enameled fitments and rose-pink curtains. An inner door led to a bathroom. At the door of this appeared a slim, dark girl, very neatly dressed. Tuppence checked the exclamation of astonishment on the girl's lips. This is Elise, Mr. Blunt, she said primly. Lady Laura's maid. Tommy stepped across the threshold of the bathroom, and approved inwardly its sumptuous and up-to-date fittings. He set to work to dispel the wide stare of suspicion on the French girl's face. You are busy with your duties, eh, Mademoiselle Elise? Yes, monsieur, I clean milady's bath. Well, perhaps you'll help me with some photography instead. I have a special kind of camera here and I am photographing the interiors of all the rooms in this house. He was interrupted by the communicating door to the bedroom banging suddenly behind him. Elise jumped at the sound. What did that? It must have been the wind, said Tuppence. We will come into the other room, said Tommy. Elise went to open the door for them, but the door knob rattled aimlessly. What's the matter? said Tommy sharply. Ah, monsieur, but somebody must have locked it on the other side. She caught up a towel and tried again. But this time the door handle turned easily enough, and the door swung open. Voila si qui est curio. It must have been stuck, said Elise. There was no one in the bedroom. Tommy fetched his apparatus. Tuppence and Elise worked under his orders. But again and again his glance went back to the communicating door. I wonder, he said between his teeth, I wonder why that door stuck. He examined it minutely, shutting and opening it. It fitted perfectly. One picture more, he said with a sigh. Will you loop back that rose curtain, Mademoiselle Elise? Thank you. Just hold it so. The familiar click occurred. He handed a glass slide to Elise to hold, relinquished the tripod to Tuppence, and carefully readjusted and closed the camera. He made some easy excuse to get rid of Elise, and as soon as she was out of the room, he caught hold of Tuppence and spoke rapidly. Look here, I've got an idea. Can you hang on here? Search all the rooms, that will take some time. Try and get an interview with the old bird, Lady Laura, but don't alarm her. Tell her you suspect the parlor maid. But whatever you do don't let her leave the house. I'm going off in the car. I'll be back as soon as I can. All right, said Tuppence. But don't be too cocksure. You've forgotten one thing. The girl. There's something funny about that girl. Listen, I've found out the time she started from the house this morning. It took her two hours to get to our office. That's nonsense. Where did she go before she came to us? There's something in that, admitted her husband. Well, Follow up any old clue you like, but don't let Lady Laura leave the house. What's that? His quick ear had caught a faint rustle outside on the landing. He strode across to the door, but there was no one to be seen. Well, so long, he said, I'll be back as soon as I can. Tuppence watched him drive off in the car with a faint misgiving. Tommy was very sure, she herself was not so sure. 
There were one or two things she did not quite understand. She was still standing by the window, watching the road, when she saw a man leave the shelter of a gateway opposite, cross the road and ring the bell. In a flash Tuppence was out of the room and down the stairs. Gladys Hill, the parlour maid, was emerging from the back part of the house, but Tuppence motioned her back authoritatively. Then she went to the front door and opened it. A lanky young man with ill-fitting clothes and eager dark eyes was standing on the step. He hesitated a moment, and then said, Is Miss Kingston Bruce in? Will you come inside? said Tuppence. She stood aside to let him enter, closing the door. Mr. Rennie, I think, she said sweetly. He shot a quick glance at her. Oh, yes. Will you come in here, please? She opened the study door. The room was empty, and Tuppence entered it after him, closing the door behind her. He turned on her with a frown. I want to see Miss Kingston Bruce. I am not quite sure that you can, said Tuppence composedly. Look here, who the devil are you? said Mr. Rennie rudely. International Detective Agency, said Tuppence succinctly, and noticed Mr. Rennie's uncontrollable start. Please sit down, Mr. Rennie, she went on. To begin with, we know all about Miss Kingston Bruce's visit to you this morning. It was a bold guess, but it succeeded. Perceiving his consternation, Tuppence went on quickly. The recovery of the pearl is the great thing, Mr. Rennie. No one in this house is anxious for publicity. Can't we come to some arrangement? The young man looked at her keenly. I wonder how much you know, he said thoughtfully. Let me think for a moment. He buried his head in his hands, then asked a most unexpected question. I say, is it really true that young St. Vincent is engaged to be married? Quite true, said Tuppence. I know the girl. Mr. Rennie suddenly became confidential. It's been hell, he confided. They've been asking her morning, noon and night, chucking Beatrice at his head. All because he'll come into a title some day. If I had my way. Don't let's talk politics, said Tuppence hastily. Do you mind telling me, Mr. Rennie, why you think Miss Kingston Bruce took the pearl? I, I don't. You do, said Tuppence calmly. You wait to see the detective, as you think, drive off and the coast clear, and then you come and ask for her. It's obvious. If you'd taken the pearl yourself, you wouldn't be half so upset. Her manner was so odd, said the young man. She came this morning and told me about the robbery, explaining that she was on her way to a firm of private detectives. She seemed anxious to say something, and yet not able to get it out. Well, said Tuppence, all I want is the pearl. You'd better go and talk to her. But at that moment Colonel Kingston Bruce opened the door. Lunch is ready, Miss Robinson. You will lunch with us, I hope. D. Then he stopped and glared at the guest. Clearly, said Mr. Rennie, you don't want to ask me to lunch. All right, I'll go. Come back later, whispered Tuppence, as he passed her. Tuppence followed Colonel Kingston Bruce, still growling into his moustache about the pestilential impudence of some people, into a massive dining room where the family was already assembled. Only one person present was unknown to Tuppence. This. Lady Laura, is Miss Robinson, who is kindly assisting us. Lady Laura bent her head, and then proceeded to stare at Tuppence through her pince nez. She was a tall, thin woman, with a sad smile, a gentle voice, and very hard shrewd eyes. Tuppence returned her stare, and Lady Laura's eyes dropped. After lunch Lady Laura entered into conversation with an air of gentle curiosity. How was the inquiry proceeding? Tuppence laid suitable stress on the suspicion attaching to the parlour maid, but her mind was not really on Lady Laura. Lady Laura might conceal teaspoons and other articles in her clothing, but Tuppence felt fairly sure that she had not taken the pink pearl. Presently Tuppence proceeded with her search of the house. Time was going on. There was no sign of Tommy, and, what mattered far more to Tuppence, there was no sign of Mr. Rennie. 
Suddenly Tuppence came out of a bedroom and collided with Beatrice Kingston Bruce, who was going downstairs. She was fully dressed for the street. I'm afraid, said Tuppence, that you mustn't go out just now. The other girl looked at her haughtily. Whether I go out or not is no business of yours, she said coldly. It is my business whether I communicate with the police or not, though, said Tuppence. In a minute the girl had turned ashy pale. You mustn't, you mustn't, I won't go out, but don't do that. She clung to Tuppence beseechingly. My dear Miss Kingston Bruce, said Tuppence, smiling, the case has been perfectly clear to me from the start, I. But she was interrupted. In the stress of her encounter with the girl, Tuppence had not heard the front door bell. Now, to her astonishment, Tommy came bounding up the stairs, and in the hall below she caught sight of a big burly man in the act of removing the bowler hat. Detective Inspector Marriott of Scotland Yard, he said with a grin. With a cry, Beatrice Kingston Bruce tore herself from Tuppence's grasp and dashed down the stairs, just as the front door was opened once more to admit Mr. Rennie. Now you have torn it, said Tuppence bitterly. Eh, said Tommy, hurrying into Lady Laura's room. He passed on into the bathroom and picked up a large cake of soap which he brought out in his hands. The inspector was just mounting the stairs. She went quite quietly, he announced. She's an old hand and knows when the game is up. What about the pearl? I rather fancy, said Tommy, handing him the soap, that you'll find it in here. The inspector's eyes lit up appreciatively. An old trick, and a good one. Cut a cake of soap in half, scoop out a place for the jewel, clap it together again, and smooth the join well over with hot water. A very smart piece of work on your part, sir. Tommy accepted the compliment gracefully. He and Tuppence descended the stairs. Colonel Kingston Bruce rushed at him and shook him warmly by the hand. My dear sir, I can't thank you enough. Lady Laura wants to thank you also. I am glad we have given you satisfaction, said Tommy. But I'm afraid I can't stop. I have a most urgent appointment. Member of the Cabinet. He hurried out to the car and jumped in. Tuppence jumped in beside him. But Tommy, she cried. Haven't they arrested Lady Laura after all? Oh, said Tommy, didn't I tell you? They've not arrested Lady Laura. They've arrested Elise. You see, he went on, as Tuppence sat dumbfounded, I've often tried to open a door with soap on my hands myself. It can't be done, your hands slip. So I wondered what Elise could have been doing with the soap to get her hands as soapy as all that. She caught up a towel, you remember, so there were no traces of soap on the handle afterwards. But it occurred to me that if you were a professional thief, it wouldn't be a bad plan to be made to a lady suspected of kleptomania who stayed about a good deal in different houses. So I managed to get a photo of her as well as of the room, induced her to handle a glass slide and toddled off to dear old Scotland Yard. Lightning development of negative, successful identification of fingerprints, and photo. Elise was a long-lost friend. Useful place, Scotland Yard. And to think, said Tuppence, finding her voice, that those two young idiots were only suspecting each other in that weak way they do it in books. But why didn't you tell me what you were up to when you went off? In the first place, I suspected that Elise was listening on the landing, and in the second place. Yes. My learned friend forgets, said Tommy. Thorndyke never tells until the last moment. Besides, Tuppence, you and your pal Janet Smith put one over on me last time. This makes us all square.